listening to PetLifeRadio.com. Hello, you're listening to Animal Party on Pet Life Radio. And oh yeah, I'm the hostess of this party. That's right, the host of this show, Deborah Wolf. And if you want to look at what I've been doing lately, and you probably do, because I'm starting to offer some great things that you can't find anywhere else on my website. It's changing every week, and we're adding deals and offers and information and all kinds of cool stuff. So go to DebraWolfOnline.com. There's a link here at the Pet Life Radio pet page, so you can find it that way. But DebraWolfOnline.com, I'm going to start offering the coolest stuff, the stuff I've tried and tested that I love that you can't get for that price anywhere else on my site coming very soon. Already, you can go there and look up the seven facts you probably don't know about pets. Weird and amazing facts. Check that out and sign up and then you won't miss anything in the future. So today, today we're leaving the dogs. We're leaving the cats. Chow meow. Sorry to tell you, cats. We're leaving you behind today because we're going to take a walk with some horses. We're going to talk about horses and people and the connection between them and how horses are being used to help people. And I'm sure you've all heard about it's called hippotherapy, which sounds really weird, like they're using hippopotamus. But the uh, therapy they do where they take usually kids, often kids who have problems of all different kinds, and they get them on a horse and everything changes. So that's what we're talking about today. We're talking to a representative from North Fraser Therapeutic Riding Association, which is pretty close to me up here in Canada near Vancouver, BC. It's a big facility. They help a lot of people. And so today we've got Sherilyn Wanzura coming to the show just to tell us about this amazing thing that's going on with horses and kids. Once in a while, you come across someone in your neighborhood that you didn't know was there. And it's such a great surprise. And someone who does such good work, like today, the Therapeutic Riding Association. I've been living here in Maple Ridge at this five-acre boarding kennel and operating here. I've been here since 1997, operating the kennel, boarding and training and breeding dogs since 2000. And I never once really came into contact with this group of people. But I think I've fed their horses through the fence. I think my kids have too. So sometimes... You find somebody in your neighborhood that you really ought to notice, and it's easy to overlook. So today I wanted to point them out. And anyone listening in the Vancouver area, I'm here. I'm here on a five-acre fenced farm that's designed for dogs with a spring-fed pond and forest and meadows, a group play, group rooms, private rooms, semi-private rooms, all set up so your dog can have fun at camp. We're Camp Good Dog, and we pick up and deliver all over the Lower Mainland, all over the greater Vancouver area. So if you want to see the happy dogs playing at Camp Good Dog, just go to our Facebook page, Camp Good Dog, or you can go to DebraWolfOnline.com and find out more. So today, I'm going to be a good neighbor, and I'm going to introduce you to one of my neighbors, which is uh, all about therapeutic riding, getting horses to work for kids and other patients, too. But the magic they do with the kids is really outstanding. So I hope you enjoy the show. Don't leave this party before it's over because the best is yet to come. Only losers leave the party early anyway. Party on. Back in a few. Nature at its best is nature at its simplest. At Red Barn, we've kept it simple for 20 years by concentrating on single-ingredient natural dog treats. Because Mother Nature's actually pretty good at this. Bones are just tasty bones. Meat treats are just nourishing meat. It's nature at its simplest. Look at the label. We want you to. Red Barn Natural Treats. Simply the best. Find it in your local pet specialty store. Try our slow-roasted natural meaty bones. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. You're you're, you're inside the VIP room. With the hottest party in town. Back to the party. Let's go. Hello. Hello. So thank you for coming to the show today. I'd love to know, you know, what do you do there at North Fraser Therapeutic Riding Association? 
Well, we offer therapeutic riding lessons to people ages 3 to 73. So a lot of our clients have physical challenges, but also the emotional and social connections that people can make with horses helps them kind of develop life skills and um, go beyond just the physicality of the exercise of the body, but also help with mind, body, and soul. We're going to have to break this up. So first, we're helping people with their <laughs> bodies. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. What is it? What is it about a horse and a person that's troubled? Because that sounds like what you're talking about. What kind of troubles? And how does the horse help the person? One of the common ones is anxiety. A lot of kids today with the technology overload and kind of the busy world that we live in, people are experiencing high levels of anxiety. And the horse is really powerful in getting us to be present, like calm our minds and just be present with what's going on. I mean, they're probably, you know, weight wise, they're about 10 times our weight. So having that big heart center to work with and to get us to calm down and reconnect with nature through animals. Animals. And in this case, we use horses. And it really helps, you know, kids and adults alike to reconnect with themselves and sort of be focused in connecting with another being, as well as reconnecting back with themselves. I want to ask you about specifically about people who maybe aren't anxious or suffering anxiety disorders, but maybe had something traumatic happen to them. Because I think of the power of a horse. And I'm a very petite woman. When I ride a horse, I feel so powerful, so powerful, right? Like that's just, yeah. that's my warrior. That's nobody's stopping me now, right? I mean, if the horse and I are in sync and he's doing what I want, I feel anyway, like I'm invincible. So what would that do for someone who's maybe a kid who's been hurt, hit, abused by adults? I mean, is there, do you ever get to work like that? We are expanding our programs to include more work like that. But the benefits are where the benefit comes in is... When someone's been traumatized, there's a trust issue. And being able to reconnect with this thousand pound animal and develop trust and actually ask that animal to do something, let's say step out of my space or let's go this way and having the animal connect, listen and do as you asked when that may not have been your experience in the past is a reconnecting and a new way of establishing relationship so that the person who may have said, stay out of my space, but but still experienced a traumatic event. This way it rebuilds a way of establishing those boundaries through interactions with the horse. So it's not just riding, it sounds like. So the people who maybe have trouble moving, maybe have trouble in life in some other way, they come to the barn and do you get them, I don't know, grooming and hoof picking? I mean, what's going on there? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. So historically, we've always been therapeutic riding. And now we're expanding to more programs on the ground. So we'll have youth groups doing life skills in which they will learn how to lead a horse, groom a horse, pick their hooves. So part of that is asking the horse to lift his foot. Like, how do we convince him to lift his foot? The grooming and connecting is just a way of taking care of a horse and building a, a relationship, and then moving on to leading and doing different exercises with the horse, asking them to maybe go through an obstacle course or do different patterns. So that's when the person's on top of the horse, right? When you actually, say all, leading, all are that, they pulling them like yeah. on leash, or are they actually riding? All that, and when we do the life skills, a lot of that is done on the ground. And then the therapeutic riding would be another component of that when they actually are on the horse. So in the therapeutic riding, they might start out with a leader and two sidewalkers on either side of the horse to help them stay balanced. And once they've worked up the core strength to be balanced, they might move to just having a leader and eventually being independent where they're actually learning the skills of how to ride a horse. So the benefits come from the skill set of learning how to ride a horse, but also the hypotherapy of just the movement of the horse on the pelvis and the core and building some strength in the body. And then the other component is the social emotional component, which is all the interactions and the different activities and experiences that the people have just being around the horses that we also facilitate in sort of groundwork exercises or grooming exercises and stuff like that. Okay, so you talk about core work. And I know that when I'm on a horse, I never know what he's going to do quite exactly. So it's hard to predict the way if I'm doing sit-ups, I predict over and over and over the <laughs> same movement, right? The horse makes me use muscles I wouldn't normally use. Every time I do go riding, because it's usually years between the times, I'm really sore the next day in places I didn't even know I had muscles, like parts of my neck and odd places. So I see how this would really get these people in shape 
Is it possible for someone who's paralyzed below the waist or is in a wheelchair to ride? Because I know when I ride, it's mostly like 80% about my legs guiding, Mm. you know? So how do they stay on? What do they do? It's actually that 80% is probably more so coming from your seat. So it's balancing yourself, which your core, you know, your seat pelvis kind of range would keep you balanced in your seat. And then so somebody who doesn't have the sensation of their legs or the control of their legs might have, in the beginning, they might have sidewalkers that just kind of help them keep vertical while they're working on their core strength. But even without being able to squeeze their legs, they can balance themselves using their, you know, their core and and their pelvis and how they're sitting upright in the saddle. In the beginning, definitely, they're supported as they develop those muscles. But those are the those are the muscles that we're focusing on and really getting the movement because once we lift a rider from, let's say, a wheelchair onto the horse, they don't experience much time being independent where they're actually, their core muscles are teeter-tottering on in that saddle. So that's a whole new experience for them. And that's really what our goal is to give them that experience so that they can work on that core and start developing some muscle. And um, as opposed to if they're just sitting in the wheelchair for days on end. I kind of wonder what the horse thinks about all this. I mean, he's probably used to able-bodied people with leg pressure holding Mm. on to him, signaling him, right? So how does he deal with a person who doesn't put any pressure where he's, does, is this something the horses have to get used to? Yeah, so there is a sort of trial and training program that all our therapeutic horses have to go through. So having somebody leading them at their head and also having the two sidewalkers on their flanks, like being so close to them, not all horses are comfortable with that level of people being in their space. So as part of the training program, it's desensitizing the horse to different things, whether it's the rider could be screaming or wiggling or, you know, bouncing around, they could be physically doing different things different things or verbalizing in different ways. So the horse has to be desensitized to that so that they don't react to those noises or those influences. And then, of course, just having the people around them is a training th- process. But oh, to be yeah. honest, they're, Most they're horses pretty- would feel crowded, wouldn't they? And yes. random shouting or odd, unexpected human behavior, that's not for everybody, every horse. No. I know with dogs, when I train dogs to do hospital visits, this is exactly the kind of thing you've got to desensitize right. them to. So they're not overreacting, you know, to a Down syndrome kid who gets so excited, she hurls herself at them because mm. she's so happy to see them, you know. And so with the horses, do you do it like I do with dogs? Do you do it starting at a distance and then gradually kind of bringing the thing they're supposed to be mellow about closer as they can handle it more? Is that how you do it? Yeah, sort of like introducing them to it and taking it away so that they can handle the the interference in different levels. So it might be, you know, bringing the scary, shaky plastic bag or the the pool noodle or whatever toy or apparatus that we're working with and introducing it to them repeatedly and seeing so that they can get used to the different toys and the different objects, as well as the different noises and sounds. So it's continual desensitization almost where you can test what level the horse is at with new objects coming towards them. Now, some horses are just, you know, there's personality involved as well. So some are are spooky, they just react quickly to things, whereas other ones, they've kind of been around the block, and they're content with the world around them. They're not, they're not as easily spooked. So there's some training behaviors, as well as personality behaviors that we have to modulate to make sure that they actually match as a therapeutic riding horse. Oh, that's so similar. Not every dog can be a hospital visitor. You got to take one that's kind of inclined to it, (laughs) you know, and it's not the dog who wins the agility race. It's usually, you know, it's a different kind of a mellow kind of a guy. So we're going to come back because I'm sure some of our listeners did not expect you to say that a gigantic horse, a 1000 pound animal would be afraid of a pool noodle. Or a plastic bag. (laughs) Now, the plastic bag one, I've been on a horse when they've seen a bag caught in a tree ruffling in the wind. And it was um, an Arabian horse. And it was probably the fastest ride of my life back to the barn. And I was about 
14. And, and, uh, and so I know what you're talking about. We're going to come back and find out more about this therapy and uh, what's going on there, how they find their horses, how they train their horses, how they deal with all this. It's pretty fascinating stuff. If you've ever wondered about horses and therapy, if you know someone who could benefit or you love horses and you just want to learn about why on earth would a horse be afraid of a plastic bag, stay tuned. We'll be back at Animal Party Pet Life Radio with me, Deborah Wolf. It's designerpetsweaters.com. Hand-knitted designer sweaters for your precious pup or cool cat. Beautiful couture patterns for your pets, including custom-knitted formal wear, casual wear, yachting, and even sports-themed. Many designer pet sweaters include feathered tammy hats, top hats, and a lot of sparkle. Each sweater includes leg loops, front paw sleeves, and leash opening. Visit designerpetsweaters.com to order your four-legged fashions today. Your pets will stay warm for the winter and be runway ready. Large or small, we fit them all. Designerpetsweaters.com Amazing Pet Expos is coming to a city near you. Admission is always free and your pet is welcome. Shopping, adoptions, free nail trims, discounted shots and microchipping, agility, a pet costume contest, and much more. Plus, meet the guys from Animal Planet's hit TV series Tank and Pit Boss online at AmazingPetExpos.com. Bring your pets to the Pet Expo. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. <laughs> You're, you're, you're inside the VIP room. With the hottest party in town. Back to the party. Let's go. Hello. We're back <laughs> at the party. That was fast. I guess the restrooms were all busy. Yes, that's always the problem. The ladies' room always has the big lineup and the men's room's always empty. If you can bear to go in the men's room, it's always worth the trip. But here at Animal Party, the dogs go outside. The cats use the litter boxes. The horses go where they're supposed to, which I think is anywhere they want. And um, we're talking with Sherilyn Wanzura, and she's coming to us from North Fraser Therapeutic Riding Association. But there are places like it all over the world, and uh, you can probably go online and, and find one. So if you want to find out about this in your area, it's a good idea to check it out if you think that you know someone. I know there's, there's people with MS who do this. There's a lot of different kids with a lot of different illnesses, including autism. Sometimes they've used working with horses as the reward that the child gets for doing the thing they're supposed to, like listen or pay attention or try something. And it seems to work really well, even though we kind of think of autistic kids as detached, horses seem to engage them. So let's talk a little bit about that, Sherilyn. But before we get to that, why is a horse afraid of a plastic bag or a pool noodle? So horses are prey animals, so they're very, their self-preservation is on high. So because they're always worried about what's moving in the bushes and whether or not that thing that's moving in the bushes is going to attack them, their behavioral reactions to things are on the spooky side. So even though us logically think that this is just a plastic bag and why are you panicking to a horse, it's an unknown thing making a lot of noise in the distant bushes and they need to be on red alert that it might be a predator making that noise. So having said that, that's, you know, partially what the horse's biology is telling them is to keep yourself safe, you're a prey, and there could be predators out there. Um, And that means run, right? Like they're not big fighters. I mean, they will nip each other to establish who's boss. But generally speaking, if they're scared, they just run. Right. right. And also their two reactions would be fight or flight. Majority of horses will choose the flight. And that's another reason why they are so sensitive about their legs. Like they don't want to walk into water or a, or a muddy, boggy area when they know that if they have a broken leg, that means death to them because they can't run. So training a horse to be comfortable with things that are, you know, sensitive around their legs or walking through footing that's not comfortable, mostly water, muddy kind of things. That's where that kind of comes from. Where I live, there's a few stables that offer you a ride that includes a swim at the end in the summer through the Alouette River. So how do they get these horses to want to do that? Do do some just like it? 
Well, and it's also a training process. Yes, they like water. They want to go cool themselves off in the water. But initially, when a horse is, especially horses that are kept domestically, they're not in the wild. So they don't come across streams and rivers and lakes all on their own. And they may not have been introduced to it. If they're living in a domestic kind of contained urban life, they might not have even experienced a puddle until (laughs) uh, a few months down the road. So then exposing them to the puddle just because they can't see where the bottom is. A lot of times you might notice that when they first go into the water, they'll start pawing. They're just checking out like, where's the depth of this glassy reflection that I can't seem to find the bottom of, but now I'm standing in it. But having said that, once they've experienced it and been exposed to it, yeah, they love it. Going for a swim could be one of their highlights. I would love to do that. It's on my bucket list of things to do someday. (laughs) I really, really want to go swimming with a horse that likes to swim. Yeah, for sure. But whenever I'm traveling and these kind of opportunities come up and I try to check it out, I can't bear myself to do it because of the condition of the horses. And I get into this conundrum where, you know, well, if I give the guy some money, at least that's something for these horses. But then do I want to give the guy some money so he keeps doing this to these horses? And it's just... I don't know. I feel the same way about swimming with dolphins. There's a lot of things where I just think, oh, do I really want to encourage this? Now with you, are how do you get your horses? Where are you getting them from? Because it sounds like they have to be pretty calm and good natured and not have been abused in the past. So I don't know. It seems like there's so many horses available for rescue and people don't tend to think how long they'll live, that their teenager will be done with college and the horse will still Mm -hmm. be in the backyard. So there's a lot of horses out there. Are you able to take advantage of donated horses or does that not work? We do take horses on free lease. However, in saying that, a lot of times people call us wanting to retire their horse, that, you know, their horse is well past their riding years and, and they're just looking for a home for them to kind of almost be passionate and kind of spend the rest of their senior years. How therapeutic riding is a job and it's not it's not for a horse that's already in retirement mode. It is a very a mentally challenging and a rather high stress environment for a horse to be in and it's not the end of the year's kind of horse. So having said that, we do get a lot of inquiries from people who more so want to retire their horse. But there's also the personality of the horse. So horses that have come from rescue or abuse situations tend not to be ideal just because the the amount of time that wouldn't be needed to train them. Having said that, there's a possibility that those horses coming from a rescue abuse situation could be trained and spending the time with them. They might actually want to be around people. But because of the the challenges of having all those people in your space, having we have over 100 volunteers and 100 riders coming for weekly lessons. So there's a lot of people coming and going, and it's not an easy job for the horse to have all this activity going around them. No, you know what? It's so people. similar to the dog thing. I mean, there's certain dogs who love to hang out at their owner's store. Love it. Greet out the public all day long. Know where to go when they've had enough. There's certain dogs like that. Most dogs would absolutely hate it. And they'd be misbehaving in no time and getting in trouble and tied up and in the car and, you know, all kinds of things. Because that's a real job. These horses are actually working, aren't they? Exactly. You know, we do our best to make sure that they're looked after and have all their needs met and they have social time and they get turned out in pastures and herds together um, because we do need to give them a mental break as well and time to be a horse. We run programs six days a week. The horses can run up to seven hours of lessons a week. That's kind of our guidelines for ourselves that we've set. So that could be at seven hours, our lessons are half an hour each. So that could be 14 different riders that that horse experiences in one week. So we want to make sure that on their off time that they do get a chance to just be a horse so that they can recoup and regenerate themselves as well. These particular horses you're talking about, I want to ask you because it strikes me as you're talking that this is almost the difference between the hospital visitors in the dog world and seeing eye dogs and the rest of the dogs. Because you can train dogs to hunt, you can train dogs to guard, you can train dogs to fetch, you can train dogs to do all kinds of things, just like everybody's horse. You can train them to do all kinds of things. But is there a connection going on here? If, if a horse is giving therapy to 14 different people in a week and each person requires a slightly nuanced, different way of communicating and way of going back and forth with the, does he want me to go fast or slow or does he need me to, you know, are these horses incredibly empathetic and sensitive? Is that the thing that's making these ones good at it? Yeah, they have to be able to tolerate 
the high level of um, need, right? Demand, yeah, like the, need. Because it's, it's turned on. Change. It's like, oh, the needs that change. So they have to be able to handle variety. But that goes back to the bomb proof. You know, they're not going to spook easy. They're pretty calm. They're pretty mellow. They're pretty trusting. But are they actually, like, do they go that extra step where they care for the rider? Are they trying yes. to help the rider? Oh, they do. Yeah. We do have some horses where you can notice as soon as the rider sits in the saddle, their demeanor has shifted and they've calmed themselves. Whether that's, I'm going to walk slower for this rider, um, you can see the horses, their caregiver kind of personality come out. They might be a little bit feisty for the volunteer as they're getting ready. And once the little rider gets on their back, they're like, oh yeah, this is my job. And now they've settled into what's being asked of them. So it definitely, I do think the horses have a understanding of the caregiving and the their job at hand. It's definitely a balancing That's very act. touching. Because I know they can be, I know they can go the other way. I know that horses know exactly when a beginner rider sits on them. And if they don't want to be ridden, they'll mm. throw that rider. You know, they know. So they know the skill level and the needs of the rider. But my question was, do they care? And you're saying, yeah, they do. They're trying mm-hmm. to give that person a safe, positive experience. That's amazing to me that they care like that for yeah, these strangers, definitely- right? Because they're not bonded to these different people or are they? Well, they do actually have a large client list. However, um, a lot of our clients will spend years with us and they'll spend those years with the same horse. They do become very attached to their horse and we actually like to foster that connection. And as much as possible, the riders will keep their horse unless they're graduating to a different horse for a different experience or a different uh, gait or they've maneuvered. Now they're independent, so they might be on a different horse. But we do like to build the relationship between the rider and the horse because that's part of the benefit as well. That's where some of the um, results come from. What happens to your horses at the end of their career when they can't work anymore? Um, Most of our horses are on free lease. We do own one or two that have been with us for a long time. And so on the free lease, they would return to their owner. So let's say it it was a school pony and the kids have grown up and then they came and worked with us for a few years and then they would retire back to their family and ideally still have a family member that's with them. Sometimes some of our senior horses or sometimes the owners might not be um, available anymore. Some of our horses have been with us for 10 years. In that case, um, we would find them a retirement home. There's a few nonprofits in the area that do work with senior horses. Um, So we have a relationship with them and finding them a home because we also want to make sure that even though you know, maybe the owner's not able to look after them anymore, that we want to make sure that they are going somewhere where they have, you know, that they can retire being well looked after. So what does that person pay for? Do they pay for food while the, but not board while they're at your facility and they get to ride the horse? Or how does it work? We assume, we assume all responsibility for the horse on the free lease. So vet bills, food bills, care bills, uh, equipment, uh, blankets, all that kind of stuff. NFTRA has full responsibility. It's when the, if the horse is like, you know what, they don't like it anymore. Cause sometimes, you know, after let's say five years of being a perfect therapeutic horse, they might be like, you know what, I'm tired. I don't want all these people in my space anymore. And mm-hmm. once we start having behavioral issues where you can see that the horse is not enjoying his job, then it's yeah. time for us to find them a new job. Cause we don't want horses that are not, not happy doing their job. Um, because that's not a positive environment or even a safe environment for everybody involved. Does the owner continue to ride the horse even though it's free boarded and free under this arrangement at your place? No. And the, oh, the owner oh, basically see. gives us yeah, full I get it. ownership and so I that understand. the horse only is only okay. working in the program. But you know what? I just saw on TV the other day, the SPCA had seized a bunch of horses and are, you know, have mm. nursed them back to health and are rehoming them. And I think people don't realize sometimes how expensive a horse can be. True. True. You know, even things like I look sometimes as I'm buying my worm medicine for my breeding mm-hmm. dogs or my boarding kennel or I'm buying something like this. And I think about the quantities, you know, I could do 50 dogs sometimes for the quantity I'd have to get in ointment or some kind of all natural salve or something, you know, for a horse. So it's just it's hard to compare, isn't it? They're expensive creatures. Yeah. And the biggest I mean, living in the lower mainland, the biggest expense is the land. You know, it'd be great to have 100 acres for everybody to run around on and play, but that's not realistic in being in an urban center. So Mm -hmm. the facility, the housing, the land is probably um, the largest cost when we're looking at, you know, boarding, which is, you know, around $600 a month, which 
um, you know, covers your spot, but you still have, you know, the grain bill and the, the vet bills and the shoeing bills and all the extra care, you know, blankets, equipment, all that kind of stuff. So you're right, it adds up quickly. The purchasing of a horse is probably the cheapest um, a part of the horse ownership. <laughs> Well, that's true for dogs too, really. And it's funny how people will try and, you know, get a bargain or, but, and it's like, you know, you're going to have spent that in a month. It's mm-hmm. just nothing com- compared to caring for an animal for its life. How long do most horses live? Once they hit around 30, that would probably be considered a senior. Mm-hmm. The ponies live longer, the minis live even longer. Um, but t- depending on the experiences of the horse and, and what kind of activities they've done throughout their life. Usually once they're over 20, they're starting to call them seniors. And But they could live. We just had a horse live till 32 the other day before he was having trouble standing up. But up until then, he still was, you know, he was an old guy, arthritic, but doing okay. So mm-hmm. that's sort of their senior end of their life. Well, is there anything you'd like to tell people before we end the show? Your website and just anything else you'd like to tell them that maybe you need a wish to put out or a suggestion, anything like that? Yeah, so our website is North Fraser Therapeutic Riding Association, so nftra.ca. And for those who are living in the lower mainland of BC, we are always looking for volunteers. We have over 110 riders that join us every week. We have almost 100 volunteers that support those riders. So we're always looking for people to come join our team, whether it's just two hours a week or if you have more time, that would be fabulous. Please do give us a call. Okay, what does a volunteer do what does a volunteer do at your place so the volunteers get the horses ready so bring the horses in groom them tack them check their feet get everything ready for the rider and then during the actual lesson the volunteers would be leading or sidewalking with that rider depending on how many people they need so you might have three volunteers in the arena at a time with an instructor and a rider and then other than that they also help with general horse care feeding the horses picking paddocks keeping things running in the background beyond the lessons as well Um, Do you need donations of other kinds besides volunteers? Do you need, I don't know, drivers? Do you need anything like that? Well, our the way we're set up is that our operating budget is close to three hundred thousand, and we raise about one hundred thousand from lessons. So we need to subsidize the other two thirds of that operating budget through fundraisers. So we have a pub night coming up next door at the um, Equestrian Center in November. We have a horse show in June every year for able-bodied riders integrating with our riders through dressage, Western dressage, different types of classes and testing. And we also have other events that can help um, just sort of raise funds and kind of help everybody move forward as we go through providing all these programs. Okay, so we were a little bit vague about the kind of people that get help, kind of kids, kind of people. Oh. Would you mind just listing a bunch of the types of illnesses or situations that are helped by your therapy? Yeah, so there's a significant number of our riders are on the autistic spectrum. So there's also, you know, riders who have multiple barriers or complications. We do have a lift so that riders who are in wheelchairs can be lifted onto the horse. Brain injuries, CP, MS, there's sort of any profile. I mean, really, the only requirement to receive the benefits of therapeutic riding is that your physician sends a medical referral prescribing therapeutic riding. Historically, that's mostly been with physical challenges. Currently, we've had a lot of riders who have been prescribed animal therapy, particularly dog or horse, and ways for them to kind of reconnect and anxiety, depression, PTSD, that's kind of a new profile of our riders. But yeah, I don't know. Yeah, there's something to that. There's There's something to connecting. I mean, I can see how it would work. You can't not be present if you're in a stall with a gigantic horse and you're trying to clean out his hooves or brush him. You have to be paying attention. You just have to. And then, you know, just the power of it to go from a person in a wheelchair to being in command of a horse or feeling like you are. Mm -hmm. That's got to be so uplifting. Do you get a lot of smiles and hugs and tears? Exactly. Lots of high fives, lots of smiles. 
And part of the benefits of being a volunteer here is also the mental health of our volunteers being able to work and support people in their rides and also have the connection with horses themselves. So we like to encourage a lot of nature and um, being outdoors. And so the after they do their ride, they tend to do a trail ride just to get the, the riders outside. And, and there's many times that I'm sitting in the office and they, they circle around the office as part of their trail ride. And the instructor will be leading a team of five through song and helping to focus the rider that perhaps would be having outbursts. But now that they're singing and riding, they're contently walking around the property. And that might be one of the only quiet times or sort of more content times that that rider has in their day. Do parents participate or are parents encouraged to go away? Like sometimes at swimming lessons, the kid is more fussy when the parent's there. Do you Mm. encourage the parents to leave or to stay? No, actually, we do ask the parents and the caregivers to at least one person to be available for sidewalking and supporting because we do need so many volunteers. We do like to have one family member or one caregiver present for the lesson so they can assist in any volunteer duties that would be needed. Having said that, not everybody is comfortable being around horses, so we do have volunteers, but we do ask that whenever a new rider joins us that they have one person that's willing to be with them for their lesson. Well, I thank you so much for joining us today. Learned a lot. And um, yeah, it it makes so much sense that this would work and this would be such a great thing for the people and um, for communities. If people are listening in other parts of the world, how do you think they could find out about this in their area? Generally, uh, therapeutic riding is the umbrella that it's under. Other programming might be under equine facilitated wellness and things like that. Or when getting into the mental health, there's programming around equine assisted psychotherapy. Yeah, the industry has been around for 30 years now is moving more into the life skills, educational and psychotherapy side of things. So there's always new programs. And and I'm sure that every country would have a um, some programming to some level of one of those uh, three instances. And it's probably going to have subsidies for those who need it, right? You're not charging the same price to every participant, are you? Exactly. About half of our riders are funded. The two main government funding programs are the autism unit and the at-home program. But we also have riders who have private funding through Kiwanis, through the Lions Club, through their school system, through different programs like that. So yeah, part of part of our operational goal is to, because our lessons are highly subsidized, is to help riders connect with funding bodies so that we can make sure that everybody who does want the experience is able to receive it. I'm so glad you came on the show today, because, mostly because of that. Because, you know, riding, it's like skiing. It's so expensive. And you have to have the gear, and you have to, your grown-up has to be into it, too. And your grown-up has to take you and sign the waivers. And mm. for people with special needs, they're not even going to be allowed. But if they could be allowed at a normal stable, at a regular place, it's still going to cost maybe $150 for an hour or two with one adult and two kids, maybe more. So this just, I mean, it's those kids are never going to get on a horse if they don't find a place like yours. And it's so nice that you make it open, that cost isn't a barrier, that a kid who really needs this, who gets a doctor's note that says, I need this therapy, you know, can get it. That's just amazing to me. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. Well, everybody at Animal Party, Pet Life Radio, we're going to wrap up the show. You can find Sherilyn and her wonderful horses. And it's Sherilyn Wanzura, which, as I told you before, you really ought to have been a wizard. But I guess you're a wizard with horses and kids. So that works, too. So Sherilyn Wanzura. And you can find more about everything to do with what they do at North Fraser Therapeutic Riding Association by going to their website, NF. T-R-A, North Fraser Therapeutic Riding Association. So you just take the first letters, N-F-T-R-A dot C-A. And that's where you can go. Or if you're in a different place in the world and you know an autistic kid who could use this or someone with MS or anything that she named, then you can get a doctor's note and go online and uh, look up therapeutic riding. And you can probably get someone an incredible life experience and some benefits to their physical being and their mental being and their sense of confidence, too. There's nothing like riding a horse to make you feel big and strong. So take it from me. (laughs) And if you want to find out more about my world and what's going on with me, the quickest way to get there is through DebraWolfOnline.com. D-E-B-O-R-A-H. W-O-L-F-E online.com. 
And you know what? I'm going to be offering you some really special deals, so you want to get hooked in soon. There'll be new ones coming every week until I have about six. And then I'm going to hold it there. Incredible things. Incredible things. I can't even tell you. Oh, I wish I could tell you. I got to make it happen first. So check in with my website and see what's up with me. And until next time, be good to your animals. Let's Talk Pets. Every week on demand. Only on PetLifeRadio.com.